For anyone wanting me to spend some time analyzing how Sweeney Todd fits into the deeper meaning of this episode, you're going to be sorely disappointed because I'm taking this an entirely different direction. Just kill me! Kill me! Ah! Now with that out of the way, my name's Chris, I'm reviewing every episode of The Office, and today we're looking at Andy's play. Women cannot resist a man singing show tunes. It's so powerful, even a lot of men can't resist a man singing show tunes. That's right, we have a flash mob, we have Michael's Law & Order audition, <coughs> and we see Angelo's seduction techniques take place in semi-real time. What an episode, let's go. I understand nothing. And you get something out of the way real quick. I talked about how I'm not a fan of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie sometime last year, and some people lost their minds, and some people were on board. Cool to both, no hate. I should clarify though, and I don't know why, and much to my wife's dismay, I have a general distaste for Johnny Depp. Like, I don't hate him, I know he's going through some stuff right now even while I'm filming this, so I'm not going to throw any shade at him, he's an incredibly dedicated actor and a master of his craft. Yada, yada, yada. That's awful. Everyone's doing to miss that guy. I just don't know why, but I don't get excited to watch Johnny Depp movies. And some of this is probably related to his many collaborations with Tim Burton, who equally creates imaginative and thought provoking stuff that makes me feel icky and I'm just not a fan of it. I get that makes me basic and it is what it is. It looks like a classic case of autoerotic asphyxiation. All of that to say, I've never seen Sweeney Todd and I'm not going to for this review. In fact, when this episode came out, I just put all of those trailers for the Johnny Depp movie out of my mind entirely. Uh, the film did well, and it probably did stoke a fire in productions like this around the country, around the country. No, that was just part, I'm just getting into the first act. So much like the lip dub cold opening, The Office is hitting on two trends with this one. One by rooting The Office in the real world by playing on the Sweeney Todd name, and then two with the flash mob trend. These viral marketing things have been around since the 90s, but in the age of sharing videos online, the popularity of these things blew up around the time that this episode was released. With these real world productions taking over malls and city blocks, being who I am, I can't just look at anything straightforward. This cold opening actually took me down a tangent, which is sparked when Andy says, He's doing a wee bit of viral marketing. <laughs> things like this go viral on the internet but only when someone's actually filming it. And no one is actually filming it. Or are they? The cast of Sweeney Todd is marketing their closing night of their production, not just to the Scranton branch, but to the film crew, which gets me to the tangent. Later this season, Michael says, Hey, will you guys let me know if this ever airs? Thank you. But taking that and the last couple episodes of the series off the table for a minute, for the last five years, the film crew has been at the office taping everything. Up until Michael's goodbye, I guess I'd always assumed that these episodes we were watching was the documentary, that it was airing each week on television, which would explain why Bob Vance is marketing his business in the same way that this local community theater is marketing their final night. So I'm left wondering which one was it? Was the doc always on the air until they pivoted the story later in the series? Or was it always known that the doc wasn't going to air until much later after they got done filming everything? I think either way you look at it, there's problems. Not that any of this is a big deal, it's just where my head goes when I watch this cold opening. It's only human natural. Okay, so not being a fan of Sweeney Todd, Johnny Depp, Tim Burton, I'm also not a fan of theater in general. I appreciate it. I understand it. I get why people like it. Last time I went to the theater, a man dressed as a cat sat on my lap. But my brain is just a little off kilter and I can relate to characters on screen in ways that I can't relate to people on stage. I've taken my wife to see a couple productions, but I'd much rather watch Sweeney Todd in the comfort of my own home than sit in a theater and watch local people do their thing. Hey, I think this guy playing Sweeney Todd is my plumber. If that's your thing, I'm not throwing shade. Theater's been around, depending on who you ask, for thousands of years. I, I get it. I'm the weird one here. But I still don't like it. I don't like that at all. Another thing I always thought was weird was that this lady drops into Kevin's arms during the flash mob. Kind of always felt like flash mobs were, you know, interact but don't touch kind of thing. 
But in a deleted scene, we find out that she's actually Kevin's sister. This is my brother, Kevin. Hi. <laughs> I can't believe you came to every show. You were good. Oh, thank you. We need to put mom in a home. There's a lot of stuff I don't really get about this episode, but I do know that Creed makes no sense in this one. His review is a fantastic little bit. The real terror comes from the vocal performances. New paragraph. But it makes no sense because you don't tend to review the closing night of a production. They send critics up front, either blast it or love up on it, because the beginning of the production is when the masses would be drawn to actually purchase tickets. So the question is, was Creed actually talking to anybody? But it also makes this line a little confusing later. Get your eyes checked, Chucklehead. Be cool, Michael. I saw this guy kill a bunch of people. Good work. Thank you. But on to the production. The way that Grandy crafted this story with the setup in the office, the second act is the cringe inducing play, and then the wrap up after the production is really interesting. Some of it we'll get to in the deeper meaning, but for now let's play a game of would you rather. Would you rather spend an eternity as Michael in Scott's Tots or an eternity as Andy in Andy's play? Well, a year ago, I'd easily say I would be Andy. Scott Stotts is insane level of cringe, but watching Andy's play a few times for this episode, I noticed something about my own behavior I haven't detected the entire time watching The Office for these reviews. I had to look away. Like the climax of cringe at the end of the second act of Andy's play is literally too much for me to handle. I had to look away. It starts with Jim and Pam being asked to move, because they didn't want to sit next to Michael. It's a fantastic joke with the iPad, the phone going off, Andy's half-baked attempt to reconcile the night. Not that I know you're a murderer. My character doesn't know that yet. But I'm suspicious. Then the three horses of the cringe apocalypse between the bottle. So you think. Balloons. <laughs> and the baby. There's something so crushing about this sequence. Okay, I think everybody just needs to relax. Oh my God, go, go, go. Oh my go. God. So the mirror neurons are just kicking in full effect. I had to get out of there. I'm not sure what it is specifically about this episode. I've done public speaking before, so maybe there's some of that. It just seems like there's so much structure in theater, which makes this whole sequence just so hard to watch. Either way, Aaron jets after chatting with Andy and the show proceeds into the cluttered but overall cheery ending. I thought that you were awesome. Stop just saying that. I am not just saying that. You can trust that I am telling you the truth. I booed someone tonight. I have no filter. But let's talk about what the writer's intentions were with this episode in the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. Season seven is Michael's final season in The Office. And three episodes into it, we have a snapshot of what the writers would try to do with this series. Relegate Michael to the background and draw the ancillary characters to the center stage. Andy takes the main focus of Andy's play as the head honcho. It's an interesting episode for this character. He's still a dope and his interest in Aaron is weird and very middle schoolish. Hoping to wow her with the stage presence is, I assume, not something that we as the audience would suspect would work. What is set up repeatedly throughout this episode is that Michael is going to make this night about him and ruin the show. And while he does contribute to the cringe, the main culprit is Andy. And regardless, the camera lingers on our beloved characters reacting to Andy throughout all of the evening. He's gone to sleep now. I closed his beak. <laughs> the way the office comes to a side for the play itself is cool. Part of that is Andy's better at campaigning than Pam was for her art show. Be a viral marketing! <laughs> From a lady and her Gabe. It's closing night. Tomorrow we have to give the theater over to the Scranton's Miss Fitness pageant. Okay, link, clink, 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 everybody. You're all coming to my show tonight, right? I'm asking you, thespian to thespian, will you please be the bigger man and come to my show? I understand how hard it can be. I just, tonight, I mean, if you could We'll keep really... looking. Yes! Really? I mean, it's not a big deal, but I think a lot of people from the office are gonna be there. Oh, yeah, definitely I'll be there, for sure. But when Andy hits his lowest point, the final show is over, his plan failed, and he made a fool of himself, his coworkers 
really like his only friends are there in his corner. And as he sings the Macy Gray song that I don't think I can play a clip of, I try to say goodbye and I joke, try to walk away. We see delight in Creed's face as Andy hits his note. I never know if this is genuine acting or a genuine reaction of a singer listening to another person sing, not knowing if they're going to stick the landing. Either way, I guess that's true and it works. And that's what they do in this episode, similar to what they did with Gabe in the season premiere. They have our beloved characters begin to react differently so that we, the audience, can start projecting those same type of feelings on these characters. Even now, His name is Andy. Weird. It's a terrible salesman. I am in the dark. Moving Michael to the background allows Andy to thrive. Yet somehow Michael still steals the show with this whole law and order thing. Are you the guy that did an entire Law & Order episode for his audition? Nope. Kung -kung! <laughs> I'm just a cleaning lady! As it wraps, they're not only bringing Andy into the show as a source of heart, but they're also bringing him in as someone to root for. Up for debate on if that really worked, but the intention is clear. Andy is now a sympathetic leader that the gang can rally around. Maybe even more surprisingly is Angela's behavior in this episode. Clearly she's manipulating Dwight. These are just my dirty old gardening clothes. They were all that I had in my car. Let's go. But it's more than that. She can manipulate him because she knows him through and through. She delays his gratification and she's playing the long game. But it's all an attempt to get him to look at her as something more than just a legal obligation. Something more than just a piece of meat. And pulling that together, make no mistake that seeing something from Angela that isn't just insert sassy stuck up joke or religious stuck up joke is very intentional by the writers here. Anytime the office ends with some sort of musical montage, it's meant to drive home those feelings. So very early on, they're taking these stabs to see who might be able to helm this show. Get it, Ed Helms? But let's talk about what worked and what didn't in the ratings. And you might have some ideas on what the writers were doing with the whole Sweeney Todd thing. If you do, leave it in the comments. If something blows my mind, I'll pin it and I'll talk about it in the season seven wrap up. This is the worst. Okay, the cold opening. I'm not gonna lie, I kinda like this cold opening. I enjoy the singing, the dancing, and everyone's reaction to the chaos. Dwight's freaked out, Creed's confused, and Michael's delighted. It introduces people to the episode's main plotline, and Michael's joke just works. Who am I playing? Andy? I'm gonna give it a four out of five. As for the episode, the episode's key intention is to invoke feelings about characters other than Michael. And in some ways, it does work. But in most ways, in my opinion, it fails. Andy, I think, needs significantly more screen time and more energy thrust into him to put him in the limelight like this. It could be argued that this was just phase one of that approach, and the real moment that Andy won people over was... It's a nard dog! <laughs> <laughs> That's my nickety name! See, and I actually really enjoy that moment because it's earned, and the whole thing just pays off. In Andy's play, he's awkwardly trying to get Aaron to fall in love with him, screws everything up and everyone just sticks around after the show and loves up on him. That might work if all of these people were incredibly good friends, but it's established that Andy tends to project more on his coworkers than what is reciprocated. You don't even like us as friends. Phyllis, you guys are like my closest friends. I just mean I don't like like you. What are we, five? Attempting to make Andy the heart of the show here it just doesn't land. Andy's arc feels unnatural, it feels forced, and it's unearned. Too much too quickly is happening for someone whose main arc so far has been... Michael, am I gay? The side stuff with Jim and Pam and the baby feels like filler, and I already talked about how I feel about the Dwight and Angela stuff. I'll say this, once again, BJ has the best bit in this episode. What time is it? This joke resonates with me so well. One, having an iPad on them during a play is weird. Using an app on the iPad for a clock rather than just 
using the lock screen is great. And the app he uses is an analog clock rather than a digital one, which is also great. Best of all though, Ryan's wearing a watch. Didn't notice that on my first several watch throughs. It's a really good visual gag. Overall, there's things to like about this episode. I'm just not a fan. I don't think it works. I think it tries too hard and it doesn't pull off what it needs to. It's probably gonna be my lowest rated episode in a while and I'm gonna give it a two out of five. It was weird, but it wasn't a disaster. But that's just what I think about Andy's play. What are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments along with a like and hey, click that subscribe button to see more videos like this. Thanks for the channel members who support this channel and thanks you for watching and we'll see you next time.